I think we're ready to go, right if you are. So welcome everybody to the fourth webinar in the Ultimate Trading Guide webinar series. We're super excited to have you guys here with us. And uh, this is gonna be a really, really good one, uh, diving deep into both risk management as well as position management and answering a lot of questions that people have. Uh, so thank you guys all for tuning in. B make sure to stick around until the end. We've got a lot in store for you guys, uh, checklists, guidelines, all of that. Uh, so with that, Rai, I think I'll hand it over to you and let's go ahead and dive right in. Yeah, so today we will discuss, you know, we've been through a couple of webinars, the first one being just the trading foundation where we covered price action. Uh, then we, you know, kind of dive deep into what edges you could have in the markets with uh, and how mindset plays a big role. And I annoyed uh, quite a few people there with mindset. Uh, then we got into setups and entry tactics. Uh, in our third, and then today's our fourth. So the first three are on YouTube, if you, uh, like Richard said. So you guys can go watch them there. Make sure you share uh, those with, you know, anybody that would be interested in the market would definitely uh, benefit. That's about, I, th I think we're already, what, north of six hours of uh, video on the first three. Uh, and today is about risk and rules and risk management. So before we get started, <clears throat> I put in a quote here today. Uh, by Gary V. It says, "Do the work." Everyone wants to be. Successful. Oh, Ryan, I'm not seeing the slide update. Just letting you know. Oops, it might be frozen. No worries. There we go. I had yep. paused it and I forgot. So before we get started, uh, I just have a quick quote from uh, Gary V. Which says, "Do the work." Everyone wants to be successful, but nobody wants to do the work. So today, and you know, all these other webinars that we have, we're insisting that you guys you know, bring the energy and actually implement some of these things that you see so that you can move from stage one to two, two to three, uh, wherever you may be in your journey. So you have, at the end of the day, it's upon you to do the work. We could sit here and talk for hours, try to help you guys, but it's going to come down to you and yourself and how you take that and internalize all the knowledge that we're trying to synthesize from, you know, the the five master classes or four master classes that we've done, the hundreds of interviews that Richard's done, the whole experience that the Trader Line team uh, with Ross and everybody, uh, you know, bringing to the UTG webinars. So next is our pledge that we always have uh, to begin these webinars. It basically says, you know, you'll put in the work. You'll do the routines, conduct the studies, do the knowledge. We're not giving you shortcuts. We're giving you a platform and a framework for you to improve. And if you take some of these uh, things with you, <clears throat> uh, we we definitely feel that uh, you will see big strides in your trading. Be it you know swing from all the way from day trading to position trading. Um, all of these concepts apply regardless of your time frame. Uh, the agenda today is we will be talking about losses. And much of you know risk management is about losses. How do how we keep them small? How do we uh, how do successful um, traders do it? Just give me one second. How do successful traders do it? And then uh, we'll get into how do how do we set up stop losses on some of the setups that we spoke about and the entry tactics in our last webinar. How do we move stops up? And you know, for stage one to stage two, it's very different. And when we get to stage three, it's very very. Uh, unique to each individual. Uh, then we'll finish it off with sell rules. Um, and the, each of these points will take quite a bit of time to get into. So Richard, if you want to take this one. Yeah. So these are just kind of common questions that I've seen a lot of traders ask over the years uh, in TraderLine private access during master classes. You know, where do I put my stop? How do I manage risk? How do I handle gap downs? Um, what should my position sizing be? when to sell into strength um as we'll cover today there's a lot of nuance um regarding these topics and a lot of answers but we'll do our best to provide some really concrete guidelines and frameworks that you can use to to answer these questions and a lot of it does depend you know we, we've come back to the idea of where are you in your trading journey are you a stage one trader just starting stage two starting to get a feel of it stage three are you actually focused on performance at that point the answers to these questions will vary along your journey, but there are concrete uh, steps that you should take uh, to answer these and, and we'll provide some great starting frameworks today in today's webinar. So John in the chat right now, any other key questions that you'd like us to answer today? Uh, I've seen a lot of these in the previous webinars, but uh, we definitely wanna make sure we're answering as many of your questions as possible. So uh, yeah, with that, I think the next slide. 
Yeah, so I, I wanted to kick off this first section with a quote from uh, the legend William O'Neill. Uh, buying a stock without knowing when or why you should sell it is like buying a car with no brakes or being in a boat with no life preservers or taking flying lessons that teach you how to take off but not how to land. Uh, basically, if you're not managing risk, you're not approaching trading the right way. You're not thinking about the downside. You're only thinking about making 100%, doubling your money, tripling your money, quadrupling your money or whatever. And that's not realistic trading. And you always want to be thinking about capping your downside, even when you find a great opportunity that you think has a lot of potential, uh, because we always want to be prepared for the worst. And capping our downside is actually what allows us to stay in the game over m many, many market cycles over decades and compound our accounts. It's no good to double, triple your money, uh, you know, not really think about risk management in a, in a year like 2020 where everything's easy, everything's working, everything uh, goes up 20, 30% as soon as you buy it. Um, but, you know, when that down cycle hits, when 2022 hits, you give it all back and then some. Uh, so risk management, sell rules, it's an even more important part of the equation than making the big money. Uh, so you have to learn how to keep your losses small um, as well as get out when the trend ends. And that's what we'll be talking about in today's session. All right, so here's uh, another slide to kind of emphasize this point. You guys have probably seen similar tables to the one on the right. Uh, basically, we've got a column that's a percentage loss. And then on the right hand side, the right column is from that loss, what is the percentage gain that you need to get back to just where you were, to just get back to break even? And you can see that you know under 10%, it's pretty much an equal relationship. You need a 1.01% gain to make back a 1% loss. At 5%, you need a 5.26% gain to get back a 5% loss. But very quickly, if you let losses get too big, and at this point, we're kind of thinking in terms of individual positions, if you let losses get too big, the gain necessary to get back to break even just becomes an insurmountable barrier. You know, there's not often that a stock is going to, you know, double easily for you. So why should you expect it to happen after a 50% loss or, you know, don't expect a 300% return easily after stock drops 75%. There's a reason that these stocks fall so hard. And often uh, that's because they're under significant distribution, need a lot of time. And even if they do resume an uptrend, it's gonna take a lot of time, a lot of work, and you're better off capping your loss when uh, geometrically you're, you're not being worked against. You're, you're, you don't need much of a gain to get back the loss you have. So uh, in terms of the bullet points here, losses work against you. Large losses are disastrous, as you can see from this table. Don't be a sore loser. I think Rye added in that bullet point. Um, you know, keep, you know, accept the small losses because that's the only way to prevent yourself from taking large losses and work the math uh, manually to cement the concept psychologically. So I'd really encourage everybody to make a table similar to the one I've done over here. Um, think about, you know, the losses that you've taken in your trading career. I'm sure a lot of people have examples where they've let a, a stock uh, drop too far too fast and you know they either hung on because they're just hoping um, or you know they just kind of moved on to another stock but I'm sure everybody has those examples but the key thing is keep those losses small because that requires a lot less work a lot less gain to get back to break even than when you let those losses kind of snowball and and uh, become extremely big and Ryan anything to add with this point yeah. So a, a few things. Um, it, one is you make sure you could pull up a chart of, uh, let's say SE PayPal square and Roku. say that, if yeah. You, yeah, Roku, any of these names that have, uh, you know, went from 300 to 50 bucks and just do the, do the percentage math on them. And you will quickly see that this relationship that we're talking about where, you know, around 10%, it's kind of like a linear uh, line where 10% loss, you need 11%. But after 10%, it gets really, really bad, really, really quickly. And the stocks that we just mentioned, they've they've halved and half, you know, they've gone down, you know, 200 bucks when they're highs. 
uh, and it gets really bad. And we see people holding those stocks, thinking thinking that they you know one day they will come back. They're not going to come back for quite a while. Like Cisco, if you pull up the twenty year chart, it took eighteen and a half years for it to come back. Right, unless you're willing to wait that long for you to uh, somehow break even after 2008, 2009, then that's a good strategy and uh, you can function upon that. But many of us that, that are here today are positioned in swing traders. And we need to understand the fact that when the market says you're wrong, and especially you just look at this, this visual table, especially when you're, you're when you're, you know, draw down on your position or draw drawdown on your account is around 10%. It, it's going to get worse every single day or every single kind of percentage you get away from 10% uh, at the end of the day. So uh, there's this other notion, uh, you know, the, this this other thought process that a loss is not a loss until I sell it. And if I have an open position, I will, I'm not kind of losing. I'm just waiting for that, you know, my, my 15% drawdown to go back to 10% or go back to 5% and I'll, and I'll get out of it. All of this, we've done it. All of us, you know, the... The 300, more than 300 people that are here have done that same thing. But you need to make sure that risk management starts with, lot, you know, looking at the loss side and not the profit side. And you need to, you know, uh, maybe in the comments, if you guys can sit, you know, put what your max stop loss is and and what you have, uh, what, what you're using today. And if you're not using one today, you need to set one today for you to even have a chance uh, to be a position and uh swing trader in the market so uh the last bit of it that i want to emphasize is just do the math manually with when you when you actually see the numbers like if you have a thirty thousand dollar account if you have a fifteen thousand or ten thousand dollar account just do the math and say okay if i were to do this how much do i need to get back to even you once you do it manually you'll see it for yourself and you your your body or your the back of your mind will never allow you to 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 be, you know, that bad uh, from that point. A lot of people just don't seem to do it. You could look at this table. You could hear me and Richard say it to you. But once you actually do the math versus your account, it, like it psychologically just is embedded in how you function uh, in the market. So I see a lot of, you know, people saying 5%, 8%, 4 or 5%, 2 to 5%. Um, so that's good. You know, at the very least, just have a number, right? That's what we want. Uh, and if you don't have a number, you're kind of just goes back to the William O'Neill quote where you're driving a car with no brakes. Uh, and it, that's really, you know, never a good sign. So, um, yeah, perfect. And I think the next slide, just some risk management rules. This is a little bit about what we're covered cover today and it's important concepts. Uh, total open risk, you know, at any given time, uh, what is the drawdown or dollar loss that you will experience if every single one of your positions gets get stopped out hard loss percentage we just talked about that what's your max stop loss percentage your max position size these are all rules that you should have written down what is the total number of positions that you'll focus on at any given time and have open uh, this is kind of an aspect of risk management as well because if you're stretched out among 20 30 names you're not going to be able to give every single one of those positions the time and attention needed to manage it correctly. It's just not possible. So we'll talk about uh, some recommendations, some guidelines for a number of positions today. Calculating your average win, average loss. Uh, this is stuff we'll get into more when we cover the post analysis webinar. Uh, equity curve analysis, we've already been through that, uh, you know, focusing on limiting those pullback periods, uh, trying to get that, you know, that rising curve from left to right. Uh, your batting average, that's another one of the key summary statistics that will focus on uh, when it comes to post analysis. I, I think that's webinar seven or eight. So, but these are really key things that you should have written down and cemented in your rule set. And very quickly before we actually dive in, um, we'll be talking a lot about rules today. And if you don't have a rule set written down as a trader, you have not done the due diligence needed. You have not put in the work as Gary V has said uh, to actually excel at this endeavor. Um, if you haven't written down your rules, you haven't thought through your system um, and you shouldn't be placing a trade. So in the chat here, um, I wanna see who, how many people have actually a written rule set down 
walking through how they screen for stocks, how they enter positions, how they uh, set their stop loss, all of that. So uh, be honest in the chat and uh, let, let us know here. So that's good. I see people coming through here. Perfect. Uh, and if you don't, this should be a wake up call. Um, why are you risking money in the markets when you haven't thought through your process? You know, a lot of people, you know, do a lot of research, you know, they're buying a vacuum, they'll do research, they'll compare reviews, they'll compare ratings, uh, they'll do all the work necessary to get the best deal. If you're not willing to put in that same work and effort into an endeavor that, you know, over decades can really make you a fortune, um, that doesn't really make sense. So put in the work and, and this is a great start today uh, that hopefully you should come away with some concrete uh, rules and guidelines uh, to start off your rule set. So, right, anything to add on this slide? No, I think we could get into the next one. So we're going to, you know, I, I'm also curious to kind of know how many of you know what any of these mean, right? Because we're going to be discussing each one of these and, and get into the depth of how you can calculate them. Uh, but it's also important to just, you know, have the knowledge of what they mean, why they're important. And if you don't, I, you know, it'll be a lot of learning today. So uh, on this slide, we just put together an example of what stage one, two, and three goes back to our first webinar and our first, you know, the the evolution of a profitable trader. Um, usually, you know, in stage one, traders don't have an idea. They don't have a written rule set. They don't have any risk management principles. That's why they have a loop, you know, uh, an equity curve that's uh, trending to the downside. Usually as stage one traders, the gains are short lived about you could be, let's just say 3% on average. And your average loss is always double or more your average gain. So average losses are always the double. That's why you see a downward trending equity curve. They really don't have any rules around max stop loss. They don't, there's no, you know, they're driving a car with no brakes. It's as simple as that. And they refuse to acknowledge that they're doing that. And some of you I see don't have a rule set. So you probably want to stop, pause, whatever you're doing. You will not be successful just trying to wing it. Uh, that's just not how the market will, uh, you know, um, reward you in the long run. Uh, they really don't know what their batting average is because they don't think stats are important. Uh, position size is a foreign concept to them. So they've sized based on feel when only stage three traders should size based on feel, if any. Uh, and positions some people i've seen start out with 2025 20, they make a whole etf out of their portfolio and expect to uh be a dan zanger type of trader at the same time those two things don't go together right uh and open risk they don't really care about it uh when they're up three percent they're over the moon and when they give it back they just say oh i'll get it back they don't have a really a, a good gauge on what they're doing and ultimately their equity curves go down so if you don't know any you know if you don't know what some of these mean you're likely a stage one trader at this point even if your gains are uh you know your losses are uh double than you know double what your gains are you're still a stage one trader because you need to learn some of these very key statistics of your trading for you to even uh, call yourself a stage two stage two traders like we spoke about are kind of the boom bust so they have good gains in the market, but they still have larger losses on a net basis. So there's a boom with the 5% gain and they follow it up with a 6% loss. They know they're kind of figuring it out, right? Uh, uh, you know, it, it, they're, they're trying to figure it out. Uh, they're close. They have a max stop loss, let's say, you know, of 10%. Uh, they have approximately, they've now figured out that many positions as a swing and a position trader doesn't work. And they have approximately 10. Uh, they still don't know their open risk at all times. So they're not, they're not, they're not treating this like a business yet. They're not treating it with the seriousness that it needs or the professionalism that it needs for them to be stage three. They know that if they were to do that, it just, you know, some, some Part of it comes down to, hey, I'll figure it out with time or uh, I don't need to do this. Or some people say, I don't need to keep track of these stats for me to be, uh, you know, uh, a little bit better. But stage three traders are deliberate. 
in what they do, right? Stage two traders, they know that they need to do it, but they don't really do it. The net outcome of that is that the equity curve is still to the downside, right? So stage two traders are almost there. Most of you in here, I bet, are stage two traders. You guys have, you know, you're, the fact that you're here today is, you know, you want to learn and you want to learn all of these different, you know, statistics of your trading. So most of you are in that bucket. And today our goal is going to be to get you to the stage three and really showcase what some of the successful traders um, are doing in the market. So stage three traders usually have a bigger gains, minimize their losses. They have a max stop loss. Let's just say four or five percent doesn't have to be four or five percent. We're just trying to profile a stage three trader. Their batting average, they know the stats on their batting average. Their position size is 10 positions, or uh, this should not say negative. So their position size is depend is about 10 to 25 percent per position, depending on where they are in their journey. Uh, the number of positions is this is actually skewed, by the way. So the number of positions is less than 10. Their open risk is always known. So they know that if all of their stocks were to hit, you know, uh, all of their stocks were to hit stop losses, they know what they're risking in terms of total portfolio risk. And their equity curve is uptrending because their gains are always bigger than their losses. And they take losses in stride because they minimize their losses. And even if they have a series of them, they know that dependent, you know, given that they have an edge. That which we discussed, they have the entry tactics, which we discussed. Now they're kind of in a mechanical state where they know that over a series of trades, they will always come out on top with a trending equity curve. So Richard, uh, any thoughts you want to add here? Uh, by the way, again, this is skewed. Uh, this is kind of, you know, position size, 10 to 25%, number of positions, less than 10, open risk is known and equity curve is up. Um, yeah, I'll add, you know, most of the traders, you know, uh, the, the great traders I've interviewed, um, in terms of number of positions, they have definitely less than 10, usually less, you know, around the five mark, honestly. And like I, like I was mentioning earlier, that having five stocks, allows you to really know everything you need to know about that stock, watch its price movements, know what's normal price action, what's abnormal price action, and manage that position really, really well and execute well on your plan um, versus having 20, 25, 30 stocks. Um, nothing too much else to add. I, I saw a question about batting average. That's basically your win rate. And there's, there's this perception that you need an 80 to 90% win rate uh, to be successful. And that's just not really the reality when it comes to swing traders and position traders. Um, every every single trader, you know, David Ryan, market wizards who I've interviewed, they they have a win rate much closer to forty, you know, fifty percent in the best markets. So you can be extremely extremely successful with that type of batting average because you're you're keeping your reward to risk ratio, you know, as we've pointed out here, eight to four percent, you know, two to one, three to one. Uh, that's what you should really be focused on versus having a really high batting average uh, because simply focusing on your batting average, you know, makes you cut gains short to lock them in and, you know, let losses run in the hopes that they become winners. And that's the opposite of what you should be trying to do to achieve performance in the market. So yeah, that that's all I think I'll add here. Awesome. So next, yeah, yeah Richard, go ahead. Yeah, so here's kind of a little bit more about about these stats, and and we'll be doing, like I said, a whole webinar on post analysis, and we'll likely uh, create some Excel sheets and give them out. That that makes this a lot easier as well. But uh, here's just you know uh, another thing to emphasize why perver preserving financial capital by keeping those losses small uh, is so so important. So here on the right hand side, I've put in. Uh, 10 dummy trades with different results. I try to keep these pretty realistic. Uh, you've got six losses and four wins. So that's out of a total of 10 trades. So you've got a 40% batting average. Uh, your average win down there you can see is 11.75%. Your average loss is a little over 4%. Your win to loss ratio is 2.88. That's fantastic. If you can get that, you can make a fortune. And out of the series of these 10 trades, you can see you've got you know, three strings of losses, two wins, then three more losses, then two wins. Uh, you've, you're keeping your losses reasonably small. You've got one 7% loss in there. 
And at the end of the 10 trades, you've got overall on this position, because thinking about this would be part of your portfolio, you've got a 20% uh, gain overall on that position on over those series of trades. So that's how you want to be thinking of this, always in a series of trades, keeping those losses small so the gains that you do have really pay for, for all of those and allow you to compound capital over time. So over and, to the bullets here. Uh, oh yeah, go ahead. Go Richard, ahead. just I'm I'm assuming these are equal position sizes, yeah? Yes, yes. Okay. This is considering equal position size, yeah. So this is kind of an ideal scenario just to emphasize yeah. the point. Um but yeah, the, the key points here is even with a 40% win rate, you can be extremely successful if you're focusing on that win to loss ratio. Small losses is a lot more important than big big gains. We we've we've mentioned this before and emphasized it before. Focusing on capping your downside is gonna is gonna be what leads to performance over time. The the wins will take care of themselves, uh, especially when you get into a really cooperative environment. Um, a few good trending winners can make up for a lot of small paper cuts. Uh, that's what we're focused on here. And you want to expect to lose with every position that you enter. You want to be always thinking about how much will I lose if this stops me out. How can I minimize? that stop, you know, that loss, if I do get stopped out, because you're going to be losing likely more than you're winning. So expect with every trade to be stopped out and think about how you can raise up your stop, how you can keep that stop loss small, tight and logical. And, and we'll dive deep into that today. Awesome. Yeah. And this is assuming, you know, equal position sizes. Once we get into how you can position size after you lose you know have a you know three trades in a row that where you're where you're losing money uh you can then scale down your position size as you string losses together so that you're doing less and less damage until the market you know the environment whatever it is that you're doing starts working again then you can scale up the size we'll get we have a example later on yep. uh, exactly on that so yeah so Personally, getting yeah, getting to the other side as well, there's another really big benefit of making sure you're keeping your losses on positions really small, and that's preserving your mental capital, preserving your confidence. Um, and at the end of the day, you know, this is just as important or more important than preserving your financial capital. Uh, Ross Haber really emphasizes this. Um, small losses sting, but large losses take you out of the game. If you suffer a 60% loss on a position or, you know, hopefully not on your account, it's going to take a, that, that's a blow up. It's going to take a lot to build up that capital base again, build up your confidence again. So you're able to execute in the markets. However, if you keep your losses in check, make sure your drawdowns don't exceed, you know, at worst 20%, you're still in the game at that point. And you can benefit from all the different market cycles, all the uptrends, all the 2020s, all the nineties periods, all of that. Uh, so the goal should be keep those losses small so you're in this game for decades for your entire career so you can compound your, out your account and take advantage of the good times. Um, executing well and taking a loss should build confidence. So even taking a loss, if I take a 3% loss and I followed my plan, I, I put my stop where I said I was going to be, I honored it, um, that's a good trade, even though it was a loss. So just, just because you want to change the the reward to you know pain threshold from did i make money on this trade or did i lose on this trade to did i successfully execute on my position if you can in your mind say i did a good job when i got stopped out you'll be you know well on your way to becoming a stage three trader because that's the right approach the right mentality to have when trading um and what's great is if you keep your losses small even if you have you know, a string of three losses, five losses in a row, and if you keep those very tight, just one good trade that you execute well on, that you get a gain on, can pay for all of those, and you'll quickly see that your confidence becomes back. So even if you did lose a little bit of it uh, when you're experiencing those losses, just one good trade that you execute well on uh, and that you see some results on will bring you right back to your A game and allow you to, you know, be refreshed, renewed, and, and ready to execute well in the market. So, right, anything to add on the mental side of things when it comes to risk management and, and keeping the losses small? Yeah, so I think, you know, it, to begin this webinar, all we've said is kind of the same thing with in different ways to try to communicate with you guys on you're, you're going to have losses pile up 
at some point in time and you're going to have a string of losses come through and you're going to have, you know, uh, times in the market where things are, you know, you're, you just have the, the Midas touch, like you just buy something and it starts working and you, you, your confidence goes through the roof. How do we kind of take those highs and lows of our emotions and try to find some sort of equilibrium that we trade with? So when I make a whole bunch of money very, very quickly, I don't, I, you know, one way is to, in your mind, at the end of the day, the only money that you're making is what you take out of the trading or investing account and have that in your checking or savings or where, wherever else, right? That's the actual money that you're making. So that gives you some sort of realistic equilibrium that where in your mind, you, you don't get too worked up uh, when you string a, a few losses together and you don't get too excited when you have a few winners together. So it's all part of the game and focus on kind of the bigger goal that you have, right? It's not to win that one trade. It's not to lose, you know, I'm not going to lose on that one trade. It's about over a series of trades, what is going to happen? And over a series of, you know, the whole year, what can I extract from my account so that I know that I'm making progress at the end of the day, right? So um, losses will happen. Losses will happen. It's part of the game. It's it. They happen to the best people. Uh, you can have the most perfect setup, which we'll get into uh, in a couple of slides here. And that setup can gap down on you and you could give away progress that you made three to six months, but then you have to pick yourself up and do the same thing all over again. Cause that it's not, it doesn't happen every single week or every single month, but every once in a while, you'll have something like a, like a CRDO come through where it all looks fine a lot of entry tactic edge whatever 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 everything checks off and then that thing gaps down 25 percent on you uh based on some sort of news right that comes down to proper position sizing right if i i see a lot of people uh, you know it's not a game of ego if you don't if you size 10 percent and we'll showcase that uh you know if you size 10 percent and you have four to five winners in a row you'll still you'll still do the same uh in terms of performance uh, for a guy that sizes up to 40% and then has one losing trade, right? Because the math, that's just how the math works. So that's where position sizing comes in, uh, where you want to execute smaller when you just, the market says you suck, just stay on the sidelines and you will execute the biggest when your system's working because you have a string of gains to back you up uh, in a row. So I think with that, we could go to the next, right? Yeah. So let's get into a little bit of defining your risk. And this will be, you know, a quick review from last time, pretty much. Uh, we've got a consolidation pattern. We've got a pretty standard pivot entry point, And we've got a stop set at uh, the higher low here, a, a pretty tight and logical stop loss. Uh, so we've got an entry at 100, stop 96.5. Um, and the, the key thing that I want to bring back today, and I think it's so, so important. If you can't manage your risk tightly and logically, you're not executing at a proper setup. That's really important. So as you go back and do post analysis, especially on your biggest losers, think about your entry point and consider, did I enter it at a spot where I've got an edge, where there's an entry setup, where part of an overall strong stock, a strong theme, uh, the edges are playing in my favor. And is it at a spot technically where I'm expecting a big move and I will know quickly if I'm right or wrong. And if I'm wrong, I can exit with a very small loss. That's really important. So if you can't manage your risk like this, it's not quite, it's not a proper setup and you have to do more work to look for a better entry point. And you have to do a little bit more learning and I definitely consider rewatching yesterday's webinar. Uh, Ryan, anything to add uh, on this slide? No, I mean, if you don't, you know, at stage one, two, which many of, uh, uh, you know, participants are today, you have to know a definitive point. Like that goes back to the very first slide where, you know, if you don't have a max loss and you don't have a stop loss that you know that at this point I'm wrong. So at this point, when the stock comes back in and breaks this, I'm wrong because when I, when, when I entered over here, right? Uh, my thesis, whatever it was, 
multiple edges at play, uh, markets looking good, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Whatever your thought process was over here, if the price comes back in and violates this, it's all out the door. Whatever you said over here is all out the door, right? You have to think of the next 10 trades instead of this one because a lot of stage one traders you have change of plans over here. You just come up with some creative reason in your mind to say, you know, the market will be fine. Let me just see what happens the next couple of days. And the market is just not fine because your entry tactic said you're expecting directional movement from that entry point. And the directional movement you anticipated was to the upside because all the probabilities lined up. But then the market saying, hey, the directional movement from this entry is not to the upside, it's to the downside. So it's, a, it's just a matter of listening to what the market's saying, right? It's just a matter of really the market is telling you and giving you feedback and the market communicates with you through wins and losses, right? And when it says you're wrong, you step back, step out of the way, think of the next 10, 20 trades. I, you know, a visual reminder on your desk or a visual reminder on your phone, whatever way works best for you to say that when something, when my stop loss hits, I will not argue with it. will get you 10 steps ahead of everybody else that's in the market because their psychologies are wired to come up with creative reasons when their stops are hit. And if you could wire your thought process to say that, hey, market's saying it's not working, I will get it on the next one. I will get it you know, over the next 10 trades it's perfectly fine because the math works out really, really well. So, yeah. Um, it, just to add one more thing, in a sense, uh, a strong entry tactic is, is and buying right is kind of your best defense because that allows your worst case scenario to be as small as possible. Um, so yeah, that, that's the only thing I wanted to add here. So moving on, I think we've got a few more slides about this. So defining your risk, the math. So we've got an entry at 100. We've got to stop at 96.5. Uh, the percentage risk is 3.5. You just have to divide the numbers and do the math there. And you can also calculate your dollar risk because some people prefer to think in percentages. That's kind of my style. Rai, I know you're a little bit more um, the dollar side of things. So in order to calculate your dollar risk, all it would be is the number of shares multiplied by the difference between your entry point and your stop loss. So on 100 shares, uh, your 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 max loss would be 350. There, that's that's your anticipated stop loss um, if your it does get hit. So definitely do the math ahead of time with all of this. And I would say, uh, in addition to setting a, a max like percentage stop, create a dollar figure where if you if you lost more than that on a trade you violated something bad and you want to analyze every single one of those trades this is an exercise that when i first started trading uh, this was this is one of the challenges um where you know if there's a loss over 500 dollars, we had to analyze that trade and walk through every single thing that we could have done to prevent that loss uh from being you know that big so set a line in the sand both in a, a percentage amount as well as a dollar amount and uh, make sure you do the math and know how much you're risking on any given trade. Uh, next slide. Now taking it to the portfolio level, because I did see a few questions about uh, portfolio risk here. So if you've got a total portfolio size of 100K, we're just using that to, to make the math easy. It could be 10K, 25K, uh, $1,000, $500, whatever it is for you and where you're at in your journey, that's fine. Um, what you want to do is divide that dollar risk by your total portfolio, and that gives you your portfolio risk based on that single position. And then in order to calculate your total portfolio risk or your open portfolio risk at any given time, you basically sum up all the positions you have, sum up all their individual risks together, and that gives you your total drawdown um, if every single stop was hit. And you can do this based on dollar loss as well, your total dollar loss amount if every, th every single thing was hit. And like we said, it's really important to keep track of this metric um, because you know often when the trend changes and we enter a correction, a lot of stops are getting hit all at once. A lot of stocks are changing character. And so you wanna know at any given time, you know, if the trend changes, what is my expected drawdown? 
And am I comfortable with that? Am I comfortable with the risk I'm taking right now? Or, you know, should I recognize that we're a little bit later in the trend? I'm starting to see stops get hit a little bit more. Maybe I should tighten up my overall risk and, and you know, limit the new risk that I take with new positions. So, um, yeah, I think it's really important to be able to calculate both the single position risk, uh, both in a percentage dollar amount, as well as take it to the portfolio level and keep track of these metrics. Uh, right. Anything to add about, you know, keeping track of those metrics or, or calculating it or anything like that? No, I mean, if today you don't know, let's say you have a position in the market and you don't know that if, if that position was hit, how much of your portfolio is at risk, you haven't that year stage one. Uh, and it's as simple as that over a series of trades, you will continue to lose money. That's the raw truth. And if you just don't know these two stats, which are very basic as to, you know, uh, this, what's my dollar risk or what's my percentage risk and what's my open portfolio risk at this very moment, right? Uh, then you, you, it's not good enough at the end of the day. And that's just how it goes um, in the markets. The So the only other thing um, that I do have to add here, here is I know a lot of people have Excel sheets that do this. I think going that way is really good initially because you get to see the numbers for yourself. Again, I'm very big on if you do it line by line and mathematically, maybe on a, even a notebook, at least the first couple of years, right? Uh, the first couple of years, you just write those out. Then, you know, you get to a state where right now I, I operate on whole numbers and based on kind of, I, ha I, I know in the back of my head, because I could say, okay, I want to buy 10,000 of Uber and I'll, you know, place a stop here and everything's kind of mental for me. But stage one and two, it can't be all mental for you because you don't, you haven't gone through the paces to, for you to even uh, get to that state where, you know, I could say, okay, I'm going to sell 3,000 of the 10. I'll get this here and I can move my stop loss up. I could do that mentally because I've done the manual work, right? So make sure you do, do the manual work, be it Excel sheets be it manually, be it, you just get a calculator app right on your phone and just crunch some of the numbers. It will help you so, so much because then, you know, you know, 6% of my portfolio is, uh, you know, 15,000 shares. This percent is that if I'm trading a $30 stock, my number is this, that math, if you know it, it will be so good because at that point, your, 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 your risk management is not only visual, but it's also mental at the same time. And having those two align is super powerful in terms of how you go about um, managing your portfolio and also your position size. So, yep, I think we move on here. So, uh, just a, a few key things about defining your risk. You know, Ryan kind of mentioned all this. Uh, you should always be aware of your total open risk and draw down if all stocks hit their stop losses that you own. You are in complete control of how much of your capital is at risk at any given time. And think of it like managing a business. You always want to be aware of your risk and break even line so you can sleep at night and um, are able to make you know um, informed decisions. That's really, and, really and important. Just, just to add, if you're using a calculator and you're just using a position sizing calculator, I see a lot of them out there, right? Uh, mindlessly, it's, it, it's not going to help you. Like if you, if you know, I have a $50,000 account and a 10% position size is X number of shares for a $30 account. You don't know that it's not good enough at the end of the day, right? It's really not good enough from a risk man. If you need a calculator to do that, I'm not saying you need to be a meth, you know, magician for you to be successful, but you should know you know, when I trade a $30 stock, I could buy X amount. When I trade a 50, I could trade X amount. When I get a hundred, I should, you should have a really good feel for the portfolio size that you're managing as to what kind of positions you could put on. I see a lot of people get into, you know, I will punch this into my calculator. I'll get the exact 632 shares I could buy. All that's fine and good. Uh, it's through a calculator, but if you can't do that mentally, I could buy approximately 600 shares. You haven't done the homework. That's that's all it tells me at the end. And a lot of traders tend to, you know, I have a calculator. I'll punch in the numbers and get it. it that's that's secondary. Like that's way too mechanical. You take the art out of it. It's good to do it initially, but it just means you're relying on something 
uh, as a calculator to tell you your position size. Just have some mental, you know, have have an idea of what you need to be doing without some sort of calculator as well. I think that's it, it will give you that. It's just a next level, right? Uh, the way people think right now is calculators, but if you have an idea of how you manage your business and stuff uh, in, in trading, it would, it's just a whole different game. You'll be ahead of the, the pack. So let's talk about the fun stuff. Uh, defining your risk, what about gap downs? So. Yeah, so I, I anticipated some questions on this, so uh, we definitely want to address that. First, you know, I think these happen a lot less often than you think. I think, you know, there's one of the main excuses why people don't set stop losses. Oh, a gap down is going to take me out, then it's going to rip. Um, one, you know, gap downs just in general happen a lot less often than you think, especially when you're when you're operating from pretty solid entry tactics and strong stocks. They do happen, but you you want to recognize that these are negative expectation breakers. They're, they're negative feedback from the market. As Rai kind of walked through, if you enter here and your expectation is in, you know, a, a strong move to the upside and it does the opposite, you should honor your original plan and simply exit and take the loss. Even if it was less than, if, if it gap below your stop loss, exit when you can. It's as simple as that. Um, think again in, in terms of decades, in terms of many market cycles one trade in that context does not really matter and you just want to preserve your capital at all costs and make sure that you, you can still participate in those if you think back uh as your 80 year old self and um you know you're, you're thinking back on a trade where there's a gap down are you going to be happy with yourself just you know taking the loss and moving on and continuing to preserve your capital or are you going to be so worried about all oh, it might come back i'm i'm it'll just recover, you know, this is just the algos, all of that. No, you're going to be proud of yourself for honoring your plan and getting out and uh, taking your stop hit and moving on to either when it sets back up again or uh, on to another opportunity. Awesome. Yep. What about larger gap downs? What about larger gap downs? <laughs> you know, these happen, you know, rarely, but they do happen. Um, I, I've experienced a few. Um I think it, this, and we should dive deep into the kind of psychology perspective, because you know when these occur, it doesn't feel good. It it hurts. It hurts a lot. It the the money is gone. You have to kind of recognize that. Uh, you want to make sure that you deal with it objectively. And again, number one rule is capital preservation. If a stock gaps down twenty five percent on you, that breaks your plan. Uh, your rules tell you to exit. You should do it calmly, objectively. And, and that, that's just the way to go. That's kind of what you have to do. You have to, you have to cut off the rotten part of, you know, that you're dealing with. Um, so simply you want to exit and preserve your capital. I'd also recommend taking a break from trading that day. The worst thing you can do is compound an error by, you know, letting your emotions take control of you, trying to revenge trade. Oh, it's going to fill the gap. Oh, now it's not filling the gap. I got stopped out again. Let me size up higher because it, it's making a u-turn now now it's going to recover the algos are, are now moving it higher no you want to take a step back recognize that you've, you've taken an injury when you've gone through something you, you've twisted your ankle you've broken your ankle and you're not right in the right frame of mind to trade at your best at that point so take take a seat make sure you you go through your rehab go through your physical therapy so that when you do come back, you can you can take it in steps. You can start sizing again because something like this, people don't quite recognize how much it affects their psyche until in hindsight, you recognize that your loss is way bigger than it should have because you revenge trade into all these things. So, you know, a, a good way to frame the question is how would a trading champion ham handle the gap down? You know, a lot of you guys aren't, aren't yet trading champions. You will be, uh, but how would Mark Minervini treat it? How would David Ryan treat it? They would simply cut it and move on. They recognize it's part of the game and they they recognize that over time they've got an edge and they'll make it back, but that money is lost at this point. You know, I've dealt with a Fastly gap down. I, belt, I dealt with the CRDO gap down. Net, net, you come up on top because you've got an edge and there'll be another uptrend, another stock, another opportunity. But in that, in that moment, you just have to do the, the tough thing cut your loss and move on. Um, and that does 
provide relief right in that moment because at that point now that you're out of the position you can think objectively again and then again you just want to take some time and and build up your confidence but uh right any thoughts on on your end with this yeah so let's say you know we take uh crdo for example which is a recent one um and we, you know the stock's doing everything right uh you're holding that position and you have you know 20 25 percent on uh and that thing just gaps down a whole bunch after hours and now you're in a, you know you're in a bad spot knowing your numbers in terms in terms of hey it's violated my stops be it after hours or what whatever the case may be i need to get out of this position instead of you know uh blaming externally uh, look at the numbers that you have in t- internally to make that decision. You'll be far ahead, right? Um, the the other thing that you want to do is let's say yes, you caught the gap down, and now things are bad. You should always have uh, an objective view of okay. It, people use R multiples as a way, right? So that I had you know four out of the five last you know of my trades, I've I've racked up my R multiple to be plus 14 or plus 15. Now this CRDO is a minus 20, let's say, right? So now you're minus five in terms of the R multiple. That would give you a really good uh, perspective of where you sit and things won't look as bad. And when, when you put a perspective, you know, a lens from, you know, on it from that uh, point of view, what happens is you will take the loss a lot quicker and a lot easier on yourself than saying, oh my God, this position is down 35% uh, and you don't have any idea on how it affects your portfolio, how much position size you put on that name, what it means, you know, let's say this happened, you know, from uh, May to September, you made a lot of progress this year, right? Uh, uh, In terms of uh, uh, the trend in the markets and now you've given it all back. It's, it comes down to the, you know, the fact that, your drawdown from your recent high is way too, uh, you know, it's it's way too big and you haven't kept track of the numbers. At the end of the day, if you have the numbers and you function on the mathematical equations that are kind of, you know, your position size, your open risk, portfolio risk, your uh, risk per position, it will be so much easier and you'll manage it like a professional instead of an amateur at the end of the day. That's what separates, you know, stage two from stage three. When CRDO was hit, a lot of people got caught. I bet you the professional traders that that look at it and they'll know their numbers. Hey, okay, I just lost 20 R and I'm up like 40 R on the year. I gave back half my gains. I'll just take it and we'll continue. That's their mindset. That's how they function. Yes, it hurts. Obviously, it hurts. It's just that's human nature. And you give back a lot of progress. You go back three, four months, right? But they position size properly. When they see the loss, they know their numbers on how much they gave back. They know what they need to do in the future to, to recover from this loss because they have a system, right? And they know exactly how much they gave back. A lot of traders, I feel when they get hit with a gap down, they have no idea. They have no idea how much they've given back. They have no idea how much they position size. They have no idea how much, you know, this hurt their portfolio. They're just so focused on the like, hey, uh, this is going to gap down. And if it rallies, I'll sell. And then it doesn't rally. Then they continue holding. Then they turn into investors. Then this and that and that. All of that crap comes into your mind because your emotions are high. You can't make rational decisions. And you don't know your numbers on top. When those three things pile up in a row, you're you're putting yourself, you know, for you're, you're setting yourself up for failure at that point, right? And we don't want to do that. We want to go back. We want to go back to the basics of know know your numbers, know your position size, know your open you know portfolio risk, know how much a position hurts you when it gaps down, right? If you know that number right off the bat, you'll make a rational and a better decision than anybody else in the market. So that's really it's a, it's a subtle difference, it's a very minor difference, but it's the biggest one to actually know how much it's hurt you uh, if you were to catch a big big gap down. Which is ine- inevitable. It's going to happen to all all three hundred, more than three hundred uh, twenty five of you uh, that are here right now. It's going to happen once in a while, but you need to know your numbers. That's how you recover quick, uh, relatively quickly. So. Yeah, and and what we're touching on here is more about news related gap downs. Uh, we'll, we'll cover earnings at the end, and those those are much different. You should anticipate all that, 
think ahead of time the risks that you're taking when you're going through earnings and we'll discuss how stage one two traders should deal with those but uh yeah this is more out of the blue news type events uh that can happen so with that let's keep on going here got a lot to cover so now let's touch on managing stop loss so setting the initial stop loss uh, we mentioned this in in the entry tactics webinar but it's good to you know uh, re-emphasize it think about this where does your entry tactic fail we talked about you know having that plan set and not saying oh it's it's broken the higher low now i'm going to use the 10 day moving average now I'm going to, oh it's broken that i'm going to use the 21 ema ah uh, now just the bottom of the base if it stays above that i'll stay in you want to pick a line in the sand and stick with it listen to the price action and listen to the mark the, the market structure itself if you enter on a breakout you're anticipating that it moves to the upside if it shows through price action that it doesn't do that that it hits your line in the sand and you should exit it's as simple as that and wait for the next setup um and also you know just reconfirming this keep it tight and logical that's your number one defense and i think i've got more about that on on the next slide just re-emphasizing tight and logical stop losses here uh this is the same slide as last webinar but so important i thought we should show it again entry tactics must allow for a tight and logical stop if they don't it's not a valid entry tactic logical means a violation would signal that the setup or entry tactic has failed and you should exit uh, tight means the stop will limit losses to just a few percentage points ideally and if you can't set such a stop there isn't a setup or entry tactic wait you have to wait for the price action to form how you would like it to form you've got to wait for uh, the boger hand to be dealt where you can see all the cards and then you can make a decision uh, so i think that's really important and, and ross is is someone who's really emphasize this uh, a lot in my head and and to all the trader line members so uh, next slide right uh, and this is just emphasizing this you know if your expectation is that it moves positively from that entry point and it moves to your stop just exit and wait that's it right anything to add with with tight and logical stops no i mean if you're wrong you're wrong you're wrong and <laughs> you just have to listen and if you're hard. wrong you're wrong you're wrong well well said that's that's, yeah, a, it, that's a tweet right there <laughs> so so if the market is telling you and you won't listen it's just you have an ego and you need to stop uh it's very easy for me to say and it's very hard for people to do but you have to do it if you want to be successful right uh if you take a string of losses and you have taken a string of losses and you haven't exited at proper points that you set forth for yourself, you're really dishonest to yourself at the end of the day. If you think of it from, you know, from that perspective, you're saying you're going to do something. You're saying when you enter a stock that you will exit if it does this. And then you come up with a very creative, uh, just for lack of a better word, bullshit story. Uh, when it hits your stop, you're just dishonest to yourself at the end of the day. Right. So don't do that. It, it's the only way you can really be profitable is to go and, you know, uh, listen to this, listen to yourself at the end of the day. You're saying you maybe a lot of traders do the, Hey, this is, this is my entry. This is my stop. And uh, if this does this and they have a whole, you know, solid plan. And when it comes to executing that plan, they won't listen because now they, their emotions, right. Their emotions take over and they don't want to listen to what the market is telling them. So you have to listen to the market. You have to listen to what you're saying for yourself. And uh, I think you'll be, you know, you just do those two things and have some objective on what we spoke about in webinar one to three. If this is building upon that in webinar four. So, yep. Uh, so adjusting stop losses, you know, managing your stop loss, when should you move it up and, and all this. So you want to raise stops as the trade makes progress for you so that you're lowering your over, overall risk. And, and we'll touch on specific guidelines, you know, for when and how to do this based on where you are in your journey. Um, but it's important to not choke off the trade. Um, you want to give the stock room to breathe so it can go through normal price and volume fluctuations. You can use ATR to kind of determine this, uh, but you want to make sure that you give it enough room so you don't just move up your stop, get stopped out, and it's just been a normal reaction. Maybe the market pulled back one day and then the stock continues to move higher. It's done nothing wrong, but you're stopped down no longer in the trade. Uh, stick with your objectives and style. If you're setting stops, you know, more at 7% on a standard position trade breakout from a base, 
Um, you don't want to, you know, you know, exit, you know, move up your, you don't want to move up your stop like a swing trader. If you're position trading, you don't want to move up your stop like a, a, a swing trader. If you're, I said the same thing again, but basically you want to stick with your style and make sure you're managing your stops in a way that makes sense for your time frame and uh, your strategy. Uh, you also want to be stopped out when the trend ends. So however you define that uh, is up to you. We'll, we'll talk about that more in position management. And you can use many different tools for adjusting your stop losses. You can use a moving average as a stock makes progress for you. Um, I like the 21 EMA to trail it just below that. As I mentioned, you can use ATR to make sure that you're giving it room to fluctuate. You can think in risk multiples, as Ry mentioned, you know, when the stock is up 2R, I'll move my stop to break even. When it's up 5R, move it up to 2R, something like that. So there's many different ways to do this. We're kind of talking about the high level perspective, but we'll give some concrete guidelines in just a minute. So Ry, anything to add on this slide? No, I think uh, what we have here is, you know, just, have some sort of plan around it that's all that matters um and uh we will get into the specifics of like how exactly you do this uh because um i think a chart example would, would be much better right um in this instance i don't have much to like these different tools um like the r multiple strategy uh which was made popular by van tharp right? If you haven't read his book on position, he has a whole book on position sizing. I don't know how many of you have read that, uh, but it's really good. And it gets, it really dives deep into just positions. It's like 300 pages of position sizing stuff. And that's all he talks about. That's a good resource. Um, as you grow your account or as you build more experience, you get more, you move towards more simplicity, right? Rather than more complication. So stage one and two traders, I see they will come up with this very creative system. That's good. But when, when your account size grows, I am like the way I manage it is just simple SMA system with a couple of whole numbers. If it violates those levels, I'm out. If it keeps me in, it keeps me in. When the, the SMA gets above my, you know, moving it, when the moving averages get above my average price, I then revert back to the SMAs as my stop losses. And you will go through these variabilities of being super mechanical to being, you know, uh, super, yeah, super simple, but that comes from experience because you've tried all of this stuff and you're mechanical and you know, all of this, but then you just kind of, you know, you're working off a, you know, a third of this, a fourth of that type of type of style, but that takes, that takes time for you to get, get, uh, get there. Yeah. yeah. And the Van Thar book is super trade. He has two books, position sizing guide, uh, if, I hope I'm saying the right title and then super trader, both of those books are really, really good. Uh, in my opinion, uh, he wrote yeah. them, uh, no, 20, 20 plus years ago. So, yeah. And, and Rod, just to get back to how you do it, uh, it's pretty much two closes below the 21 day. Is that right? That that's, that's how simple yeah. you keep it in a, in a yeah. Uptrend. So mine is, let's say if I enter a stock with a top side pivot of 30, uh, then my, you know, I want directional movement off of that 30. And my stop loss is very tight, two to three percent below thirty, right? And that if it doesn't move, my my whole the way I function is it has to move at the pivot that I choose because that's the the place that I'm saying that the stock will get directional. And my anticipation of on that direction could be the upside or the downside. And if it's not doing what I anticipated or wanted it to do, then my two to three percent stop loss will hit, and I'm out of that name. So if Uber type of name. 2% uh, is a little bit better. If it's a CVNA type of name, then you got to give it six, 7% because that's the ATR stuff that, you know, the average daily range for that or the average true range for that names, something like a Uber versus a CVNA. CVNA is 10 to 12%. Uber is three to 4%. So I, you know, my initial stop loss is based on that. And if it makes progress from that point, and one of the, you know, the 21 day moves above my average price of let's say $30 and five cents, I then go back, you know, and, and we'll start using the SMA because then I've controlled my risk. I've controlled my risk. I, I, I've done the hard part and now I will see if it wants to reward me even more, move up 10, 12, 15%, or it can come back into the SMA and just stop me out at the very least. I won't lose any money, right? If it's not a large gap down, uh, like we spoke about, if it's, which is 95%, 99%, I would say, over the course of your trades, 
you will not have those, you know, back to back to back large gap downs. It will be very steady uh, pullbacks into the MAs. And then I, yeah, that's how I kind of manage my, you know, my entry anticipate directional movement, my original stop two to 3% below my entry or six to seven, depending on the average daily range makes progress. I switch, you know, if it makes progress, I, I raise my stop up to get rid of my risk or I flip if the 21 uh, day is right around here and it gets above that entry, then I switch to the 21. And I just, that's what I do again and again and again, just back and forth uh, with the different positions. Yeah. Great. All right. Moving on here, moving your stop to break even. I, I want to hear your thoughts on this ride too, about how you, how you do it. Uh, it depends on your style. Again, if you're a position trader or swing trader, you might treat this a little bit differently. Uh, the market also impacts this. If it's a choppy market, you want to be a lot more aggressive. I know in 2022, as soon as I placed a trade, I was pretty much, as soon as I made progress, I was making sure uh, my stop is at break even to prevent that loss. Um, but, you know, a guideline that you can use if, you, if you're up one to two risk multiple, multiples, you can adjust your stop to break even. But again, you don't want to choke off the trade too early and, and you want to leave the stock room to breathe, especially given its character, given the the average range over a 10 day basis, uh, you want to make sure that you're not uh, choking things off too early. So just a normal day uh, where it just recovers and keeps going on uh, stops you out. So Rye, how do you personally handle this and what, what guidelines you think traders should use, especially if they're stage one or stage two? I look at my average gain over the last X number of trades. So if you're like a if you're like a day trader, you have daily data, right? If you're a swing trader, you might have weekly data. So I look at the last, you know, 10 trades as to what the market's telling me. So if the market's telling me that uh, this is a choppy environment, what that means is my gains are usually, I, I actually had, you know, in 2022, if you traded those oversold rallies, I had three to 4% gains on all the, like literally all my positions. But I would give them away because I was, wasn't was really listening to my average gain, right, that I had over the last 10 trades. So so there's two two aspects to this. So you have your entry, the stock moves up, but then the market comes into play and it comes back in where this initial move up might be 2 to 3 to 4% as swing traders, right? Uh, we get that and then we move that stop up it comes you know comes back and stops us out we'll talk about how you sell uh, you know uh, into strength based on average gain i is is one way to do it but what you want to do is as soon as the stock moves up you know let's say my average gain is 4% over the last 10 to 15 trades the stock my stock that i own now is up 4% i could move my stop to even at that point you know take risk out as much as i can and see if the market behavior is going to change. Or the other way to do is I have my last 10 to 15 trades. My average gain is 4%. This stock is up 4%. I just sell randomly. You know, I know this is a choppy market. The It's rewarded me for my uh, the, the setup that I have. It's up 4%. And I, you know, in a choppy market, what will happen is that gain goes away. I go back to my average gain and say, okay, this is aligning with the stats that I have randomly just you know sell it move on to the next setup that's the, so there are two different ways uh to to go about it on how you can minimize your risk but the key in those two methods is you're still moving your stops to break even based on your average gain right so um you want to do that because as soon as you'll hear the best traders say the same thing they're not concerned with how much they're going to make in a good market, it will reward you. May to September this year of 2023 rewarded you, right? And and made sure that the average gain moved from four to seven. A lot of the choppy market wipes went away and things made a lot of progress, right? And when that's happening, that will show up in the numbers. Your average gain over the last X trades will move from four to 5% to eight to 10%. And then you can treat the market a little bit differently. Uh, but the key point here is you want to you know minimize your risk you always look at it how much am i going to lose not how much i'm how, how much am i going to make the making part is the easy part if you're up five percent six percent i know traders that just sell randomly because they're stage three they have a feel for the market they don't need to know their average gain even though it's good to know it and they will they just know the vibe of the market at that point in time and they'll randomly just sell it so um focus on the risk side, especially stage one and two, only that side matters to you.
right? Uh, you want to get negate. The more you negate your risk, the more you're mentally going to, you know, make better decisions and the more experience you're going to build up because then you'll see something working and you'll try to exploit that again and again in your trading. So, um, is that we're good on to the next Richard? Yeah. Uh, yeah. The only thing I'd add based on what we already said is you can use alerts, you know, to, yeah. to, to let you know when a stock is approaching a stop and, and uh, when you should, you know, move up your stop, all of that, use your alerts. They're your friend. I'll let the computers do the hard stuff for you. Uh, that's all I add here. I think we, we covered this already. Uh, stops on multiple positions. I, I personally treat them as separate positions until, for instance, if I buy within the base, add a little bit, then the stock finally breaks out of the, the base and, and starts forming higher lows again, then I might treat them as the same position. But until it does that, um, I'll treat them with two individual stops, kind of two different positions in my account. And I think the only thing, uh, other thing that we want to say, yeah, as, as you make new buys on the same name, uh, the position size should lower overall to keep your average cost as low as possible. Um, right. Anything to add on? Yeah. So on positions? that, let's say, let's say I have a, I have a 10, per, you know, my initial buy is 10% and I'm building towards a 25% position uh, over multiple buys. That's something that position traders do a lot, right? Uh, you, what you want to do is, let's say you buy 10% and you buy 20% over here. Your average cost is going to just get skewed to the upside where you're buying twice the, the amount of shares that you, you know, you're supposed to be buying here. That's a mistake that a lot of people tend to make, you know, oh, I want to triple down on what's working for, for me, but then a normal pullback in that name takes them out of the game and they're not looking at the longer picture of, you know, you average up with reduced position sizing if you're talking about the same name, right? Uh, you want to scale that up. So if I buy 10% initially, the next one can be 7%. The next one can be 5%. So I get closer to my 25%. But my average cost is also trailing up so that you don't put yourself, you know, entry two goes up and then you, you know, you've tripled down and it comes back in and your average cost is, you know, where it's not ideal, right? And the stock, stock comes back in and just, you know, does a normal pullback and you put yourself in a bad position because you've bought a 10% and then a 20% a position to really double down, uh, which is what I hear a lot of people say. So always make sure that your initial buy is kind of your 10%, you know, your biggest buy, and then you're scaling in. So it could be 7% and 5% for the next two so that your app, you know, the math works out in your favor when the stock has a normal pullback. All right, we'll get, really get, get into position sizing. So position sizing, so key principles, we'll get, now this is where we're going to get into some real examples of a portfolio. Um, you need, you know, need system-based. Uh, so position sizing really comes down to experience at the end of the day. So it, I, I, what I tend to see is a lot of people generalize position sizing independent of the stage that they're in. If you're a stage one trader, uh, we'll get we'll have very specific guidelines coming up. You you can't put a position size at 20, 25 percent. You haven't you don't have enough experience to do so. You haven't earned the right to even go that high. You don't really know what you're doing. You don't know your stats. You have no idea what the hell you're doing. And if you don't know that stuff, there's nobody, you know, you don't have any right to go 20, 25, 30 percent that stage three three traders do. And that's kind of, you know, the the downside of social media as well. A lot of people seem to think that, you know, if Trader X on, uh, you know, is doing this, uh, I need to do the same thing for me to, to match kind of, you know, to be him in a way. So let's say if Dan Zanger is putting up a, a position size of 20, 20 to 25 or 30 percent on a single name. He's been in the market for 35 plus years. Ross has been in the market for 35 plus years. Mark Minervini has been in the market for 20 plus years. These Stan Weinstein has been in the market for 40 plus years. These people have earned the right through experience to get them to those position sizes. And you do not have a right from year one to seven to be doing that to yourself because it magnifies your emotion. It allows you to make bad decisions. 
that's why you're a stage one and two trader because you're not taking the journey into the con you know into account as to how those traders that you follow got to that position size right so keep that perspective keep that perspective in mind if you see someone putting up a 25 percent 30 percent 40 percent position size 50 percent i think is stupid but some people do it it works for them uh, your blow up risk as stage one and two traders, you, you don't have the emotional experience. You don't have the mental experience. You don't have any experience uh, at all to handle those situations. Whereas they do, they know how to handle it when things go bad. You don't know how to handle, you know, when things, so don't size up too fast. That's the fourth point that we see on the slide. The second aspect to it is position size with momentum. So if you're stringing together a few wins in a row, let's say I put up a 5% position, right? And I have three names, 5% position, each of them hit a 8% gain, and I see momentum. And the market's communicating back to me and saying, this is a good environment. You know, I'm going, I'm rewarding you. And I have a, a string of three wins that, that I have. And the market's telling me it's a good environment. I can then move my position size, let's say from 5% to 8%. And see, hey, is the market still rewarding me, right? Keep the series of trades, keep the whole journey of you're going to make 500 trades over a span of, I don't know, three to four years, depending on what type of traders you are, right? Keep those in mind instead of, hey, I need to size this up at 30% because X person on this posted this and I follow them and they're doing this. They're way ahead of what you where you are in your journey and you need to make decisions for yourself, not mimic other people making decisions for you. The second is as you hit a wall, as markets get choppy, as environment gets bad, as the, the May to September run and September to now ended, right? The runs now ended. Things are getting slapped lower, you know, uh, breaking the 50 day ELF, CELH, these type of stocks as they're coming back in, if you're still placing the same bullish position size, right? On You're still going long with the same position size that let's say you were in May at the start of a trend and your drawdown from your highs is more than five to 10% already. What are you doing? Because you're working against the market. Your, your math is working against the market as well. You're not putting on tester, you know, test positions. You're putting on full positions to test the market. That's insanity, right? At the end of the day, and a lot of traders do this. They don't look at how much of a drawdown they have from the top, how much they have scaled back from their highs. They're, they're not looking at the numbers and they're just not aware. And the momentum that comes, you know, from that, which is feedback from the markets is consistently negative, but they refuse to reduce their position size because they feel like, hey, it's going to work. The next one's going to work. The next one's going to But if the market's saying, you have four losses in a row. You have no right to go, go to full position size at that point in time. You have to, you know, go from your full position size to an eighth or a sixteenth of of what you're trying to do. Um, you know, a sixteenth to test the market and see if the waters are again, you know, warm enough to swim at the end of the day. So that's the se second aspect of position sizing. If you do it with momentum, right? Keep the bigger picture in play, where you have three to four to five trades. You string together in a row, then you step up, you know, you have, you, you turn on, you know, uh, a switch and you say, okay, now my position size goes from 5% uh, to 7% or 5% to 8%, but have some mechanism so that you take in the staircase up to position sizing, not just going to 30 thing doesn't work. And you still put on 30 because you feel like the market's about to turn around. Right. So, uh, Let's get into some some of the guidelines uh, next. So trade your biggest size when the market is cooperative. Easier said than done, but a series of trades will always give you the information and the market to talk back to you. Uh, trade the smallest. You want to be trading. So these guidelines are, this is what you want to be doing. We'll get into how you do it uh, in, in the next couple of slides, right? You want to trade the biggest when the market's good. You want to trade the smallest when the market's bad. You want to stack up your probabilities. There are different ways you can have, you know, average gain, average loss, break, you know, open risk, etc. But you want to stack your probabilities by counting the number of edges that a setup has and then size according to that. That's one way. That's how I do it. Um, it takes time and experience. We already talked about that. You gotta, you have to pace yourself. 
you have to go from one to two, two to three as, um, you know, the different stages and how you evolve as a trader. And the last bit is, yes, you can size up, but you have to earn that size. And it boils down to you can put on big position sizes and your equity curve will still have relatively low volatility if you built up the experience to earn that right to get to 25 to 30%. So now we're going to get into like stage one, you know, as a stage one trader, if, 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 if you're a stage one trader right now, some general gu guidelines is just to, to, how do you get from stage one to two, right? We're just talking to stage one to two right now. So if you're a stage one trader, put a max stop loss rule into play. Just put that into, you know, Put that rule, have that, and that will curb your losses, right? That will that will minimize what you're doing. That's just one step towards turning around your equity curve as stage one traders. The second is reduce the number of positions. I see a lot of stage one traders have massive, you know, portfolios of 15 names. They have no idea what, what they're doing. They have no idea how they could track this stuff. And they have really no, you know, they don't have the stats to even, you know, take, 10 names is a lot of names. Get it less than 10. You could concentrate on what's important. At least, you know, again, it will curb your downward trending equity curve. The second, the third most important point is you haven't earned the right to size up. And that's the reality of it. If you have a downward trending equity curve, you haven't earned the right to size up. Keep it to eight to 10%. I don't care what anybody else, you know, else says, size magnifies emotion, yields poor decision making, and you don't have the experience on top, you're going to lose money in the market as stage one traders. So you need to reduce that size, get comfortable with that eight to 10%. Do that over and over and over again until you have a higher low on your equity curve over multiple market cycles. And you can prove in, you know, visually to yourself, or you can just tag me on Twitter and I'll say what's going on. Uh, but Prove it to yourself with that eight to ten percent before you go to that that next step, right? You have to be comfortable at eight to ten percent. Know your numbers so that you guys can really turn this uh, ship around from stage one. Richard, anything to add in terms of general uh, guidelines for stage one traders? Yeah, I, I think as we'll get into, you know, keep it simple and keep it consistent. Nail down the basics before you can build that intuition to. To, to become a little bit more creative in stage three, as we'll get to. Awesome. So the only difference here, stage one and stage two, it's kind of the same thing. Now you're a boom bust type of trader. You know something's working and you know that you give it back, right? So you have a max stop loss rule and you know that you need to curb losses. You figure that part out. You know that the number of positions that you know you have should be less than 10 and you can you need to concentrate your portfolio to a certain number of stocks so that you can manage those well now as stage 2 i think you know you're in that where you've moved away from 8 to 10 uh, percent and you've kind of migrated to 12 to, uh, 12 to 15 but your your losses are still bigger than your gains right so you're still trying to figure it out but you've earned some right to go from 8 to 10 to 12 to 15 at the end of the day right so um, that's kind of the only difference I see, Richard, if you want to add anything for stage two, uh, traders, yes, you're still, you know, downward trending equity curve, but you've, you have enough experience, you know, most stage two traders are around year five, six, seven in the markets, and they have a good feel for what's going on. They know what's profitable, but they're not serious enough because they're not keeping the numbers right, uh, in terms of what they're doing. So anything to add? No, not really. Just uh, yeah. probably at this point, you're starting to think much more about focusing on the loss side of the equation and, and keep those numbers in check. So uh, you'll you'll be more aware of where you're where you stand with that, and really focusing on trying to cap that downside. It's still not might not be what not might be might not be working uh, all the time, but um, you're you're more focused on that side of the equation. And stage three traders, usually, if you if you look at some of the most successful ones recently, uh, David, you know, David Ryan, Stan Weinstein, Ross, Mark, uh, any of these people that have earned the right 
to position size higher uh, is that they're stage three. They know how to get out of bad situations and they know how to uh, work, you know, in high pressure situations, even though that, they, you know, they size up quite a bit. They still keep their losses pretty, you know, they're looking at when they enter a stock, they're looking for directional movement. And if it doesn't give them directional movement, they get out, right? So they're either the market's, and you know, doing what they anticipated at the end of the day, or they're taking that loss and moving on to the next. Uh, and then you know, they're they're concentrated. They're concentrated on five positions at twenty percent, uh, let's say, or uh, you know, four positions at twenty five percent. And they they could pick the best stocks with the best potential in the markets because they're stage three, and that's a very important point. Uh, point. Uh, that you know everybody should kind of pay attention to. You can't be a stage. You can't mimic a stage three just to be a stage three. You have to earn your way to it, and you you have to build the appropriate experience for you to even get to this. And we're talking about people that have been in the markets for 15, 20, 25, 30 years that could put on 30, 40, 50 percent positions and be perfectly fine because they know how to manage their risk. So with that. We have an example. So this is from a spreadsheet that Anish at uh, the IBD meetup that we did a while ago uh, put together. So I took a screenshot of that and we'll kind of go through. Um, he did a, you know, there's a whole video. I think it's a, uh, an hour or two hours where he just spent, you know, uh, time on position sizing. I think that one's going to be a good watch uh, as well. But I'll try to, you know, go over this as to how realistic uh, you know, this 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 example is fairly realistic um, if you were to keep you know tab so this assumes that you know you have a batting average of 45 and your position size per trade is 25 percent your average gain is much higher than your average loss that means what does that mean you're kind of stage three right uh you're about twice you know you're you're keeping your losses very tight uh and minimal and let's assume that you have a account size of 10,000. So the way he, you know, this is broken down is that your first trade here and your first four trades are losses. And the position that you're putting on, uh, 1250, 1250 and 1250, you test the market three times and the market says, nope, nope, and nope. Now you're losing money. You started with 10,000 and you end up with 9,800, uh, 9,870 in your total. So you reduce your position. So the key here is as the market gives you negative feedback, right? You put on 12, this is dollars, by the way, 1,250, 1,250, 1,250. Now you reduce your position size because the market says, this is not a good environment. It's not a good environment. It's not a good environment. Now the next loss that you take with a lower position size, at which is 6% of your account, basically, uh, you still take the loss of 3%. And you still give back money and you keep that size low until you get positive feedback, right? So once you get positive feedback from the markets, let's say you put on that uh, 6% position and the market says, okay, I'm going to reward you. The market environments change, things have turned around and you have a 10% you know, gain. You make progress. You finally make progress towards break even. And then your next position, you can kind of scale up, right? Now you're scaling up to that next level, that next switch or that next step, whatever you want to call it. The market rewards you again. Now you're above break even. Now you've earned the right from trade five to trade seven to go back to the position size that you started with. And this is, you know, uh, it's always relative. So you, you went from $625 to 937 being invested. Now you've gone to 1250 as your position size. And again, the market rewards you and says, okay, here's, this is assuming an average gain of 10%, by the way, and an average loss at three. So these are 3% losses, 10% gains. You, but the most important part here is trade five to seven. You've earned the right to go back up. The market environment remains good. And now you're making some progress. As you step up your position size, right? Now you're at 2,500 bucks of the 10,000, you, if the market says, no, here's a 3% loss, dishes you another 3% loss and dishes you a whole bunch of losses in a row. But what this is trying to demonstrate 
is that your position sizing should step down as the market as the market becomes less and less cooperative. So now at this point, even at trade 14, from trade 8 to trade 14, you've had a string of losses. If you kept this at 2,500 all the way through, you would have lost a lot of money. And your drawdown from your highs would have been a lot more. And your drawdown from 10,000, which is your equilibrium point, would have been a lot more as well. So the fact that when the market tells you, hey, you're wrong, here's a 3% loss, you take it. Here's You're wrong, here's a 3% loss, you take it. And then you say, okay, I need to listen to the market. I need to reduce my position size because if I keep going at this rate, I, I don't know how many losses I'm going to have in a row, but I need to scale it back. And once you scale it back, then you start over again, right? You Okay, the market says 625, here's a 10% gain. Okay, something's changed. The market's saying you're you're good to go again. Uh, you know, th there's a 10% gain. I'm going back towards break even. Here's another 10%. Then you start stepping it up and there are going to be environments. And we'll talk about this in webinar six, I believe, when we get into market cycles. This is essentially the market communicating bad market, good market, bad market, good market, right? And that's the market cycle. At the end of the day, it's rewarding you, right? And you earn the right to step up your position sizes from trade 15 to let's say 23. This is really getting crazy, right? You're now at 100%. So this is not a realistic example at this point. You don't want to uh, have a, you know, one position, $10,000. That's, you know, you're putting your whole account in, into one. But it at that point, you know, you're, you're making progress because the market is cooperative, but you're stepping up your position size. And what happens at trade 24 is very realistic. The large gap down, right? You put on a position and you get completely whacked. And the market says, you know, you need to slow down. Something's not right. Or it could be a big gap down. Let's say you put 10,000 in. It's not a 3% average loss and it's an 8% average loss at that point. I mean, not an average loss, but this loss, you know, for trade 24 could be 8% and you lose a whole bunch more than you anticipated. But then having these stats in mind and the series of trades, you will see relative, you know, this trade set me back basically uh, to trade 21 or 22. If this was 8% or 9% gap down, it would have set me back to trade 20, but it gives you a perspective of, hey, I'm still fine. I'll take this loss and I'll continue forward because I have an idea of what my numbers look like. Then, you know, so the idea of this slide is you earn your right to position size up as the market gets good from trade 15 to trade 21. And you have to listen to the market when you have a string of losses together to position size down because then you're testing the market bit by bit, right? And if you work upon this framework, eventually as stage two traders, you turn that situation around where your average, even if your average gain is 5% and the average gain is 4%, you're going to come out on top because that's mathematically uh, you know, what's happening. But at stage three, they, they really minimize their losses because they're really good at taking losses. They're not sore losers. They listen to what the market's saying. They take it to the chin and they really, you know, position size according to what the mic, uh, the, the market is really telling. Any questions on that, Richard, or any comments that you want to add as to how this kind of works back and forth? Yeah, I think this concept of progressive exposure, it's definitely a little bit more advanced. Um, so stage one, stage two traders, keep an eye out for that. Um, Rai, I wanted to see before we move on to position management, can you touch on a little bit how you position size based on the number of edges that you feel like a, a trade has? So I think that's another important point uh, to cover here. Yeah, so let, let's say um, a good example is that I remember that me and Ross both graded was the Amazon uh, 2020 uh, coming out of the COVID correction, right? So Amazon had a couple of things, two, two things actually. So it had relative strength in the markets, which is an edge that we look for. And then it had a big bar, which resulted in, you know, big, massive volume to the upside. So it, it had two things going for it. The fact that the RS line was making a new high before price and uh, the second was the fact that it was just exhibiting an RS phase. So it, we, me and Ross kind of piled up on that name and we, there was a pivot that we set and the 
price moved above that pivot and we really sized that up. But that was based on the number of edges. So the market was pointing in the same direction. That's one that could be a market that could be a market edge. The second uh, is relative strength that 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 it was exhibiting. So those two facts combined, that position for me became a thirty percent position instead of a twenty percent. If it had just had one of the two quantitative factors that I look for in terms of the number of edges that I have, right? Let's say it has um, in a correction that name also had sixty two percent you know, relative strength as well. So 62% of the time, I know my stats. So I banked on that kind of, you know, to to make sure that I size up on that name. So that's, that's how I kind of operated was more edges that I see on a single, on a single name. I position size those names higher because my probability of seeing success on those names is higher because multiple things are aligning on that same name. And if it's this, you know, another name where only one of the edges is present, I position size less because my probabilities don't tell me to go all the way to, let's say my max position size is 30%. So um, I, I don't know if that makes sense. Maybe we need a visual example in uh, future webinars, but that's that's kind of how I go about it. Yeah, great. I think we can move on to the last section here today. Uh, and I know a lot of people have questions about this position management and sell rules. We'll touch on selling into strength, selling into weakness, all of this. But, you know, keep, keep taking it back to the kind of key points here. Our goal with position management, once we're positioned in a promising stock, is to capture the trend relevant to our time frame. A position trader might look to capture, you know, the trend above a rising 50-day moving average or uh, 65 EMA, a more stage analysis typed investor might look to capture the trend above a rising 200 day moving average. Uh, for me, I operate more base to base above a rising 21 EMA. That's my time frame. Focus on capturing the trend that's relevant for the style that you've adopted because all the risk parameters and all that is going to be dependent on your style uh, and you want to stay true to that. But you also want to make sure that you let the stock work for you within those constraints. Um, and that means let it trend above a moving average, experience natural pullbacks, all of that. That's normal price action that's going to happen. And as the stock continues to work and doesn't violate any uh, sell rules, you want to make sure you give it room uh, to actually make progress for you. Um, and strong markets, give it the benefit, give it the benefit of the doubt. Uh, there may be intraday shakeouts below moving averages that close above it. Uh, DocuSign in 2020, that, that's one that taught me a lesson there. I got shaken out below the 21 EMA. It rallied and I had to buy it back at another entry point. Uh, but in choppier markets, you want to be very restrictive and, and tighten down on your risk parameters. And if the stock isn't acting right, don't really give it uh, any room to, to wiggle around. Uh, make sure that you're protecting your your capital and gains at all costs. So these are kind of the key principles that we'll expand on in this section. Yep. So here, here's two key quotes from Jesse Livermore to, to start things off. Uh, it was never my thinking that made the big money for me. It was always sitting, uh, sitting tight. So again, let the trend work for you. Uh, here's another one. One of the most helpful things that anybody can learn is to give up trying to catch the last eighth or the first. These two are the most expensive eighths in the world. So we've kind of covered the, the first eighth, uh, you know, letting the stock um, set up how you want to set up. That's your entry tactic. And then uh, for, you know, capturing the trend, the six eighths that are the trend, uh, we'll discuss that in, in the section. And we don't want to get you know, wrapped up in being overly greedy and trying to capture every, capture every last cent, uh, but we want to capture the meat of that trend. All right, so selling into strength. There's a lot of questions about this, uh, and you know, every webinar we've done, we'll provide some guidelines here for you. Uh, but especially if you're in stage one or stage two, you want to sell at least some at your average gain. Uh, typically, a third of your total position. That helps just lock in some profits and make sure that you know you're 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 getting something out of the trade and it'll pay for the loss if it returns back to break even. Uh, you especially, can also especially yeah, stage one and two, right? Stage one and two, you, you just make it a rule that the idea is to build experience over a series of trades so that you could be uh, 
operating on intuition and feel, right? That's what stage three is really about. But so stage one and two, just make it, a, you know, at my average gain, I'll sell a third. And then the two thirds, you can be creative and manage it the other way. So at least you're making some sort of progress rather than just, you know, you see a gain and then you wipe it away. You see a gain and you wipe it away. It, it That's what a downtrending uh, equity curve really is, right? So you, you know, as stage two, there's some sort of edge you have, just sell a third. It, it's not the end of the world, right? You'll make some, some sort of progress. So. Yep. And another, you know, rule of thumb is look for extensions from those moving averages, especially if the stock has already had a pretty significant move. Um, here's some guidelines. This is going to be very stock dependent. Some stocks allow, you know, will move 50% above the 21 EMA and that's normal. Um, some will only move 5%. It's, it's very dependent on the character of the stock. Um, but here's some guidelines, you know, 10% from the 10 day simple, 20% from the 21 EMA, 50% from the 50 SMA, 100% a double from the 200 SMA. These are pretty good starting points that then you can mold and apply to different stocks that you're looking at. But uh, for instance, this example with, uh, I think this is CVNA over here on the right hand side. Um, this is a very wild stock with a high ADR. And I think these extensions from the 21 EMA are about 60% or something like that, but that's within the character of the stock. So if you learn to recognize, you know, what is this distance from the key moving averages that's accept acceptable, when it gets above that level, you can see it, it needs some consolidation, needs some basing. It happens again here. It happens again here. So you can do this visually, you can do this mathematically with a percentage or an ATR distance, but you should also be able to just recognize it visually and get a sense of when what's extended for that particular stock that you're focused on. Uh, so look at prior extensions, eyeball it, calculate it from the MA, ATR from the MA, and also uh, a, another good frame, frame of mind to, you know, when should I sell to strength? When it feels too easy, when it feels like the stock can't gap down, uh, that's often, you know, right before uh, a basing period begins or a correction or something like that. So uh, never, never be scared to lock in some profits, especially a third to a half of your core position. Uh, Ryan, anything about selling into strength that you want to add here? Sometimes I think it's just good to sell into strength if you're up just to feel good. Um, you don't need a rule for that per se, um, especially as if, if stage two traders, if you feel like, you know, you're getting very uh, uh, happy and over the moon and the market's just rewarding you. Um, I know traders, you know, in stage three, like Ross and I, like if we feel this is too good to be true, we just sell a little bit. And we just say, we need, we need to make sure that we get something out of this because if it feels too good to be true is usually that's the case in the markets, right? Uh, that was a lot of 2020. It felt too good to be true uh, where traders that usually have five to six positions average six to 12 positions because there was so much uh, working in the markets, right? So when, when you're in that situation, it's just a psychological step, right? If you, if you want to turn that ship around, when you have a positive, positive situation going, performance is a focus of stage three. Performance is not a focus of stage one, two. You, you've you not even figured out what you're doing in stage one and two. And if you want your sole focus is I want to perform. And if I sell a third, I'm giving away too much. And the, you're negotiating it mentally with the markets. It's a level of stupidity at the end of the day because you're stage two and you're stage one right? So what you want to do is build good habits. You want to build good routines. You want to build good entry tactics. You want to build model books. You want to do all the hard work to get to stage three, where you could feel like you could have an equal footing with the market. When you don't have an equal footing with the market, right? And you still want to perform and you don't want to sell a third because you want to maximize your profit. You don't really even know what you're doing to even maximize profit. So take a third, take some off, Try to turn the equity curve around. That's your sole focus is to shift it from a downtrend to an uptrend. When you do that, then you can you're at an equal footing with the market. You can negotiate how you you kind of dictate what your your actions are going to be because you built uh, that over a span of time. So selling a third, like I do it, you know, when I struggle, I go back to the very basics, and the very basics for me are if I'm up five percent, sell half, move stops to even. And I go back to that when I'm struggling. I literally don't do anything else. I, 
I, when you struggle, you go to your top entry tactic and setup. you look for that, right? Cause you have a string of losses. Now you, your confidence is kind of, you know, shattered. Uh, you go back to what you know can turn that around for you in terms of your confidence. You get that right. You do the basics and then you, you go and get creative from there. Right. So that does it, that's the same thing we said with position sizing is when you can't have equal position sizing as you rack up losses because your comp things are not working. So you need to size down. Same thing with here. Sell, sell into strength, get some profit, reduce your risk so that you can continue to, you know, be pro turn the ship around from stage one to two to three. So. Um, yeah. And one more thing I want to add here is, you know, if you bought a stock right when it's, you know, coming out of a range, it's, you've fulfilled the entry tactic and it becomes extended, especially if on the left side, there's a potential area of resistance, whether it's a moving average or, you know, a clear, a clear level from prior, that's also, you know, an added reason to take a little bit of profit because, you know, these reversals can happen. Uh, you know, it, you might feel bad the next day it goes up another 5%, but then you'll feel a lot better when it drops 20% in basis. So, um, you know, sell some into strength, especially when you're coming into a clear level of resistance, it's, you know, depending on the market as well. If it's choppier, you definitely want to do that because it's more likely going to have some type of reversal at that level. So I think we can move on to how much, Ra, you want to take this? Yeah. So, uh, Stage one, one and two, it's about consistent, you know, hard rules that you have to follow. You have to write them down and you want to define, you know, your, your, I'm going to take profits when I see the stock hit my average gain over the last 10, 15 trades, I'm going to take some off. So stage one traders, I recommend, like I go back to stage one when I have a string of losses. So I sell half the position. At 5%, move my stops up. And I act like the market is just, you know, it's it's punched me into submission. And I'm, I'm back to stage one and I need to build my confidence back up. So I go back to this rule that that literally that's what I'm doing, right? And stage two, you you know, you can sell a third at 5%, then move your stop up and to negate that, right? So stage one and two is all about consistency. It's not about performance. If you're up as much as as the S and P five hundred, it and you call yourself you know two and a half stage two type of trader, that's amazing. At the end of the day, right? Stage three is a whole different you know ball game. You you you're working on into you know, you're working on feel. You're working on uh, very market dependent or stock dependent. You know you you could trade a CVNA differently than an Uber. Uh, you know that. Uh, the tendencies of the stock and how they trade. And you could figure that out, you know, relatively quickly just by looking left on the charts and stage three kind of, you know, these don't apply, but frequently stage three traders come back to stage one and two rules when they don't, you know, when they string together a whole bunch of losses. Right. So this never goes away. This loop of, you know, how you feel and where your conf confidence level is at is usually, you know, you're pretty confident at stage three, but if you hit a string of losses, you kind of go back to your basics of what got you there in the first place. So um, these are some of, you know, the, the, frame. the, the, the most important point here is performance is a, an eventual goal. It's not a stage based goal. It's only a goal at when you have the proper mechanics of what you've done over a span of five, six, seven, eight years uh, in the markets. Only then you can kind of move away from that. So selling into weakness, Richard. Yeah, sure. So selling into weakness is the other side of the equation. Uh, this can be the remainder of your core that you started with. And you basically want to sell this core when the stock breaks the, the trend based on your definition of trend, whether that's higher highs, higher lows, it can be a moving average. That's kind of my my preference. It can be uh, based on Darvis boxes, uh, the phases of the moon, whatever you want to use uh, to sell the rest of your position. Go ahead and use that. Um, you can use a break of a range near moving average to closes below an MA like Rai does. Uh, but basically, you don't want you want to let the rest of your position work. You can maybe even add back the position that you sold as strength if there's another setup that comes around. 
Um, and we want to reemphasize in strong uptrends, try to give the stock the benefit of the doubt. If it's just a little bit below the moving average that uh, your rule is based upon uh, and it's a strong market, give it chance until the end of the give it a chance until the end of the day to work itself out and potentially close above. Um, but, you know, in choppier markets, be a little bit more strict and uh, make sure you're preserving that capital. So, yeah, this is kind of the the not the easier side, but it's the more clear cut, the selling to strength. There's a lot of nuance there, a lot of feel, especially with stage three traders. Um, this, you want to be a little bit more systematic with uh, with how you define trend and when does that trend end again for your time frame for your style. Position traders versus swing traders will define that a lot differently. So, Ryan, anything to add on your side here? Yeah, no, just I think the importance of for me, I use two closes below the MA if the if the market allows me to do that. So two closes below the 21, I usually get out. Or if the 21 and the 50 are closer together, then I use kind of both. Because uh, let's say I, I'm up 30 to 35 percent on a position. I will I will give back that 5 percent just to see what it does or that 7 percent right uh, gain. Uh, out of the 35 just to see what it does so it's really situ it's dependent on that situation um but it's important to not round trip completely right you have a 20 25 30 percent winner you've done everything right and then you don't end up rewarding yourself because you fall in love with mastercard's the best company ever and home depot's this and that boeing's amazing and all of that stuff so you don't want to get into that realm because your objective which is part of your business plan and how you describe of you know how you want to trade the markets has to be very clear right there's if you want to be a peter lynch style and you hold things over the over a span of you know years then that's a horizon you have set for yourself and you're doing that consistently that's good that's awesome it works for you as position and swing traders we can't do that so we're in it for the momentum when the momentum sucked out we need some sell rules to say okay uh, I'm up 35% and I'll give back. I'm okay with giving math, giving back seven to 9% just to see, you know, how this new consolidation plays out. And if that new consolidation continues to go down and now it's eating up and, you know, get the 35% gain is now 25, 25 is now 20. You're giving back way too much at that point. So. Yeah, and sticking with this, I want to go through the example a little bit here, uh, and let me know anybody in the in the comments if you know what stock with this, what stock this is. I don't know what I'll give you, but I'll give you like a, a digital high five or something like that. So, um, so let me know your guesses in the comments. But here we see a stock trending above a rising twenty one EMA, rising fifty SMA. Uh, we form a consolidation here. We try to break out, and then we form a higher low here. There's like a clear higher low that's that's put here we can't quite hold this breakout level and we break below the low of this range and the 21 ema all in one bar and that would be kind of my personal signal you know if not i'm if i'm not already out on this failed breakout or, or this reconfirmed failed breakout i'd be selling the last of my position here if i hold it from lower and from this point on the character of the the stock changes Position traders might have held this until, you know, a gap below the 50 day moving average. That's their style. That's their rules. Uh, but for me, the trend changed at this point. Uh, and from this point on, you get you can see it gets choppier. Uh, it finds resistance at those moving averages. We start forming lower highs and lower lows. Um, the moving averages are now declining. The stock is trending below those moving averages. So however you define the shift from this uptrend to downtrend, and what makes sense for your style, that's how you should sell the last core of your position. So I think I think that's a nice example to put it all together. Uh, and Rye is the only person who got it right. So uh, there you go. Uh, I didn't I, even cheat. <laughs> yeah, I didn't even cheat. So this is- I remember the 600 on Zoom. That's yep, why. That's yep, all. yep. So this is Zoom back in the 2020 top. Um, and uh, yeah, this it was a clear ch trend change, but- uh, you know, a stock that had been, you know, the leader, the face of the 2020 rally. And uh, if you just listen to price and volume, you would have noticed that trend change. Awesome. Nice, Ryan. I give you a digital high five. There, there you go. Good job. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I think this one's the, this one's really important. Um, if you want to curb your downside, you need to know 
relative, we, we spoke about equity curve, right? You want to have a visual of what you're doing so you can manage it professionally and not be an amateur, right? So that's kind of, you know, that takes, we took that to, to a whole new level today. You want to know your average gain, average loss, open risk, portfolio risk, et cetera, et cetera. We gave you a whole bunch of parameters. This is, you know, some of the best portfolio managers that I know tend to use this as a tell of what, how they're going to manage money in the markets. So if your portfolio, let's say at the beginning of September was up 20% on the year or 30% on the year, let's say, right? You're up 30%. Now the September correction happens, right? We get a pullback in the markets. Things are, you know, September, 2023, you get a pullback in the markets and you're now 5% off your highs and then you're 10% off your highs and you're 15% off your highs. Portfolio, the, the way some of the most successful ones manage it is they have kind of circuit breaker approach as the, as you give back money in terms of performance, total net performance uh, in the markets, you have to kind of scale back your exposure, right? Let's say you're managing a large account, but the same, and you know, approach can be applied to what I call like a higher low in your equity curve, right? If from May to September, I made 30% on my account, right? Uh, and September, I'm giving it all back. I saw one of the comments uh, in the chat say that they gave it all back, uh, for, you know, in, in about a span of 10 to 15 days. That means you didn't have an approach where you're kind of stopping yourself from yourself. As your equity curve came down, you need to scale back exposure because the market's consistently telling you you're you're this is not good, this is not good, this is not good, this is not good, right? You're taking the elevator down when you took the staircase up. And when you take the elevator down, it's not a good feeling. Uh to, you know, in terms of portfolio management, because you're given back from a psychological perspective, you're just back to May. And all that effort that you made, you did everything right. And then when it's time to, you know, the market's telling you to scale back, you're not scaling back. So at 5% of your total drawdown, half your position size immediately, uh, that's, this is still a very broad rule, right? This is not a position-based rule. It's it's kind of like a total portfolio base. You can only operate at half position sizes when you're down 5% five, 5 off the your off your portfolio uh, from, from your immediate high, sell the weakest positions right away at 10%, no new buys, raise stops up because you need to see what the market's doing because 10% off your immediate high on your equity curve, that's a big pullback. And, and the, literally the market's saying, if you're still buying new positions at that point and you have existing positions you should be managing, don't do that. That's a bad recipe. Uh, at 15%, you go to cash, and then you kind of, these guidelines are very broad. You don't have to kind of follow these to, at 5, 10, 15. I think as stage one, two, it's better to look at, you know, string of trades first and have these be a little bit tighter. I would say at 3%, stop yourself from yourself at 5% and maybe at 15 instead of 5, 10, and 15. These 5, 10, 15, it's mostly for bigger portfolios because you have such liquid positions and you're holding, I don't know, 50, 60,000 shares of Uber and, uh, you know, 10, 15,000 shares of NVIDIA. At that point, you need to kind of wait and see because you don't want to be, you know, irrational uh, in portfolio. But as stage one and two, I would say, you know, three, five and, you know, 10% are really good ways to say I'm going to half my position size no matter what because the market's giving me some negative feedback and I don't want to continue to give back that money uh, to the market. Richard? Yeah, no, nothing much to add here. Um, I think shout out to, to both Eve and Mike Webster. I, yeah. I think they've kind of uh, reinforced these lessons really nicely. And uh, again, any guesses to the chart that you see over on the right-hand side? I'll give you a hint. This is well, actually, I won't give that hint. I think that's too easy if I give that hint. So yeah, let, let us know in the chat uh, what you think here. Uh, but yeah, this is a really important concept um, because we want to make sure we cap that drawdown. We don't want to just keep losing money during a correction, fight the market, keep operating the same way. We want to listen to the market, react accordingly, and protect ourselves from ourselves. Um, so I think we can move on, but this is this is the cues in the most recent 2022 uh, correction. So, uh, Rye, I guess you didn't get that one. No, I need yeah. price. 
Yeah, you need price. You're cheating. So earnings rules. Uh, so yeah, go ahead. Earnings. So always know your earnings dates. Uh, you, you you have to know them. Uh, they they are events in the market that uh you're you're giving away money. Uh, if you know you just go into earnings. This happened to me once in a positive way. Uh, back when uh Roku was uh did they did their IPO in about two months from IPO they reported earnings and I was under the under you know I I the way I understood is it takes a minimum three to four months for them to report it after the IPO. I held the stock. I literally bought it uh, a couple of minutes before it closed and I was up. Thankfully, I was up like 30% after hours and I didn't know the earnings date. So it's, it's good when it, you don't know when that happens, but the opposite could have been very bad for my account and would have been disastrous, right? It would have been, it would have set me back at least, you know, two, two and a half months, just not knowing the earnings date. So even though that situation was positive, like the whole, you need to know your earnings dates. Uh, the second one is you need to know your implied move. So if it's an IPO, it's hard to get implied move numbers, but usually the option market prices a stock at, you know, Netflix is going to move a minimum 10 plus 10 or minus 10%. It's a, you, it's usually a good gauge as to what the maximum amount of move will be after hours when something is reporting, uh, check your profit cushion. So if you're up, let's say, you know, for stage one and two, I, I would recommend just sell it. Um, there's just too much going on and, and with respect to your, your the downward trending equity curve to throw a Hail Mary and say, hopefully this works as a lottery ticket. A lot of stage one traders do that. They buy options. They get, you know, they come up with these create again, very creative reasons that they will be very, very rich very quickly and they will turn to stage three overnight. None of that happens. Right. So stage one and two, maybe if you're a later stage two trader, you can start getting into this earnings uh, market and seeing, you know, if I have a 20% cushion and the implied move is 10%, if this happens, then you're properly planning what 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 your actions will be depending on what the, the stock is reporting. Uh, consider selling a portion of the position. I, that, this one, Ross emphasizes a lot. Uh, a lot of people, you know, stage three traders, they don't act macho when it comes to earnings. They don't do that because... Uh, earnings are binary events. They could be to the upside. They could be to the downside. We don't really know which way they're going to go until the news comes out and, you know, um, and it's time to make a decision. So always sell a portion. You could sell a third something so that whatever it is that happens in a binary event, if it's a positive outcome, I see a lot of, oh, I should have held, you know, oh, I should have held Splunk uh, SPLK because it was bought out by Cisco. It's such a stupid statement to make at the end of the day because you don't know that is going if that's going to happen, right? You can only manage risk real time, is what Richard said in the first three webinars, and that's what you could control at that point in time. For you to act like you know what's going to happen is is far from the truth at the end of the day. So sell a portion. These are binary events. Some will work your way. Some won't. Uh, and, and you could, you know, gather stats as you transition from stage two to three to see how you want to manage these. These are a, a few good ways. First way is just knowing when they are. Second is the implied move. Third, having a good profit cushion and the profit cushion being above the implied move is usually a good sign and always sell a portion that will keep you in the game, right? You see a lot of traders say, you know, you, you got to find a way to stay in the game. So at stage one and two, as your equity curves continue to go down, you can't stay in the game. Because over a span of time, you'll just blow up your accounts. So if you stay in the game, look at it over a series of trades. Even if you miss an earning gaps or two as stage two traders, it's perfectly fine. It, you take that as part of your journey. And at some point, you know, when you enter that name and it goes from one earning cycle to the other and it moves ELF, like moves 40%, you have ample cushion. And then that 40 turns into 60% because it's gapping up multiple earnings cycles in a row. So steps for managing risk. I think this is more so just a. It's a summary. It's kind summary. of the key, the key points here, the high level. So first step, place a tight and logical stop loss. Uh, you should definitely, if you've watched uh, last webinar and this webinar, you should know exactly how to do that. Uh, as the stock progresses, uh, raise your stop to break even, depending on um, your stage, you'll, you'll know how to manage this. 
as the stock continues to rate uh continues to rise uh, move that stop then into the money uh then you want to trail your stop based on your preferred methodology whether it's you know below significant higher lows with a moving average whatever your process is uh, then you want to consider selling into strength as the stock gets extended from your buy point this can be based on a percentage gain a percentage from a moving average uh atr multiple from a moving average risk multiple that that you're at uh, whatever makes sense to you and your process go for that and then the last step is you know sell the rest of your core position into weakness as your backstop gets hit uh as the stock changes character changes trend uh breaks below the moving averages that's kind of the overall uh method for both managing risk as well as uh managing the overall position so hopefully We've kind of brought everything together into these six key points. If you can do this with every trade, uh, you're golden. Um, and if you don't yet have rules that kind of address each of these six points, you need to implement them. So, Ryan, anything uh, to add here? No, I think uh, we could wrap it up uh, there. I think, you know, today's session was, you know, mostly if you didn't take anything else away, know your stats is the one thing. Second, have a maximum stop loss. Know that losses after 10% are, you know, it will, you're making it worse for yourself. That table that we put at, you know, at the, at the very start of this presentation, above 10%, you're making the situation worse. Know that losses will happen. They will happen. You have to be really good at taking them. Don't be a sore loser. Be a good loser. Learn from them. See what you did right. See what you did wrong. Uh, and, you know, you guys can go back, rewatch this. If you're watching this on YouTube after the fact, you, you could ask us questions in the comments. We're more than happy to answer. And this, this, I, you know, most of you are stage two, figure these stats out. And over the span of, you know, next couple of weeks, figure them out. You could post them on, on uh, Twitter or X and uh, tag Richard and I, and we're more than happy to take a look and, you know, work with you guys on that as well uh, on social media. So Make sure, you know, as the more professional you get about it, the better chances you have of success and turning around your equity curve, right? The, and and the better um, you can you can get relatively better quickly if you get more serious about these numbers that we spoke about today. So download the ultimate trading guide. The link is in the chat description if you're on YouTube. Uh, if you have, you know, if you, you could recommend this, it's 100% free, 115 pages, 16,000 words, seven frameworks. It's about nine frameworks now. Maybe it will be 10 soon. I don't know. Uh, but we'll keep going. Uh, we'll keep going. We'll see you guys also next Saturday. Always recommend the tool DeepView. We're continuously developing it. Uh, we had a big release for pre and post market uh, this past week. And uh, over the next few weeks, we'll be releasing the dashboard uh, and a whole bunch of breath metrics that will be uh, in this tool. So ch definitely check it out. Uh, right now is, you know, I, I saw a question about if there's a, if there's going to be a Black Friday sale, 50 bucks for this platform is the sale. And I don't think it will last very long, especially into the end of the year. So early adopters, 49 a month, 490 a year. Um, and we were going to build journals. Uh, you know, the journaling aspect will be part of Deep View. Uh, the portfolio management aspect will be part of Deep View. Uh, any if you're a stage analysis trader, technical trader, fundamental trader, we have all the data that you need. Uh, and, you know, you could always manage things within the platform. So we're getting better week over week and uh, have lots to release into the end of the year as well. So with that, Richard, if you want to wrap it up and... Yeah, I think up. we'll pretty much call it there. Uh, I put the link to the ultimate guide uh, in the in the chat as well but uh as always thank you guys all for uh joining us and uh i'm glad to hear a lot of you guys have positive positive feedback of about today so thank you guys for that um we'll be keep going next week uh i believe screening and routines is is on the agenda definitely a really important part of any trader system so you don't want to miss that and uh yeah again definitely go ahead uh, read through the ultimate trading guide i think um it will help you a lot especially if you're stage one and two and reinforce a lot of key lessons even if, even if you're in stage three and hopefully these webinars uh, did as well and just to echo rye uh definitely check out dfu i think it's the best uh tool out there for our trading methodology so uh with that thank you guys so much for sharing your saturday morning with us 
And uh, we'll see you guys next week. And for everybody on YouTube, uh, definitely go ahead, uh, leave a like down below, subscribe if you're new, and uh, leave any questions you have for us in the chat. So uh, yeah, with that, thanks so much for tuning in, everybody, and have a great rest of your weekend. Bye. Thanks. Have a good one. Thank you.